Hello everybody and welcome to a brand new episode of Second Take Cinema coming at you from the glorious Impala Films headquarters in sunny South End on Sea. I am your host Jamie Evans joined as always by Rory Jocelyn. Hello. Today we turn back the clock 20 years to the year 2004 as we give a second take to Van Helsing. <laughs> Van Helsing is a 2004 action horror adventure film written and directed by Stephen Summers, starring Hugh Jackman, Kate Beckinsale, Richard Roxburgh, David Wenham, Will Kemp, Kevin J. O'Connor and Shula Hensley. It was released in 2004 and was made for a budget of $170 million. Do you know what month it was released? May. May. So it was near enough for Summers Blockbusters. Yeah. Where it grossed three hundred million dollars. Well, of course, it was. They they were trying to replicate the success of the Mummy. Yeah, three hundred million. It had. It grossed three hundred million. Say. So it <clears throat> didn't quite double its budget. No, it but sort that's of still made... a success story. Really, oh, it's still a success story. Which makes you wonder why they didn't do the sequel eventually. Uh, we'll get to that, I suppose. Yeah, I'm sure we'll find out somehow. Van Helsing received generally negative reviews from critics, and on Rotten Tomatoes has a. Uh, aggregate score of 24%, with the site's critical consensus calling the film a hollow creature feature that suffers from CGI overload. Audience polled by Cinema Score gave the film an average grade of B, proving that there is, as always, a divide between audiences and critics. James Berardinelli of Real Views gave an extremely negative review, rating the film half a star out of four, calling it the worst summer blockbuster since Battlefield Earth. Jesus. That's, I mean, that's too far. Uh, like, yeah. There are problems with this film, a lot of but problems. that's too far. It's not a half star film. Like, that's just insane. Furthermore, he wrote, there are quite a few unintentionally funny moments, although the overall experience was too intensely painful for me to be able to advocate it as being so bad it's good. Some, however, will doubtless view it as such. More power to them, since sitting through this movie requires something more than a strong constitution and a capacity for self-torture. Mick LaSalle of the San Francisco Chronicle greatly disliked the film, writing... Writer-director Stephen Summers throws together plot strains from various horror movies and stories and tries to muscle things along with flash and dazzle, but his film just lies there, weighted down by a complete lack of wit, artfulness and internal logic. What Summers tries to do here is use action as the only means of involving an audience, so story is sacrificed, character development is non-existent and there are no attempts to incite emotion. Instead, Summers tries to hold an audience for two hours with nothing up his sleeve but coloured ribbons, bright sparklers, and a kazoo. Which, what he... <laughs> the kazoo, definitely. Mm. What he proves is that this is no way to make movies. However, Roger Ironically, Ebert... Ironically, we all make movies this way now. One of the big problems I have with this film, and we'll get to it when we get there, is how, over, how much it overuses CGI, yeah. which is now every single blockbuster. Yeah. Uh, however, Roger Ebert of the Chicago Sun-Times gave the film three out of four stars, stating, At the outset, we may fear Summers is simply going for FX overkill, but by the end, he has somehow succeeded in assembling all his monsters and plot threads into a high-voltage climax. Van Helsing is silly, spectacular, and fun. And we're here to talk about Van Helsing. I think I put this one in? You did, yes. I did? I wouldn't have put this in. Um, because I hadn't seen this film since I was about 
15 or 16 probably uh remember really liking it had it on v i had it on vhs and i must have liked it enough that when vhs went way of the dodo i bought a dvd a dvd copy and then never ever watched it (laughs) until until last night i saw this at i've i've told this story before so i won't tell the whole story again but basically uh same way, I, same way I saw dodgeball. We had a teacher at school who, at the end of term, where you can't be asked to teach them anymore, would bring in pirated DVDs <laughs> of movies that were still at the cinema. And he bought in Van Helsing while it was still in cinemas. I'd never heard of it. Um, we watched it. I quite enjoyed it at the time. I thought it was very cool how they'd combined Frankenstein, yeah. Wolfman and Dracula into one narrative. Yeah, I like that idea. Having watched it again, which we'll get to, I'm not entirely sure it actually works. But I, I really liked that idea. This was actually the first thing I saw Hugh Jackman in. I saw this before I saw any of the X-Men. Right. So she, in my head, Hugh Jackman's kind of always Van Helsing. Right, interesting. With the long hair. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and this is also the first thing I ever saw Kate Beckinsale in. And that started a lifelong love of Kate Beckinsale. And I decided to see if it still held up today. Now, you had seen this before, yeah? I have, yeah. Uh, so, I didn't see it at the... C- did I? S- I can't recall if I saw this one at the cinema. I know I saw it in League of Extraordinary Gentlemen the year before at the cinema. Um, I can't remember if I saw this at the cinema on DVD, but I saw it roughly on release, near enough. Either release of DVD or release of cinema. And I enjoyed it. I remember not... I remember this and League of Extraordinary Gentlemen being similar in idea in that it was basically take a bunch of monster movie concepts and throw them all together. This had the benefit of having the actual legit creatures of, you know, universal cinema. Yeah, they had the rights to the <laughs> yeah, characters. Yeah, whereas League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, it was like cheap knockoff version of... Oh, really? Yeah. So it's that thing where it's like, it's the Invisible Man, but instead we're just going to call him Transparent Man. <laughs> transparent Boy. It's, it wasn't Transparent Fang Boy. boy. Fang, fang Man. <laughs> Sounds like Mortal Kombat characters. Fang Man versus Transparent Boy. Yeah. Here comes Fur Boy. Oh, wait, no, that's just Uncle Alf. <laughs> <laughs> Uncle Alf, use that razor I bought you, man. Shave you know your what? back. Alf, the, the big bear character from the 80s in the Mortal Kombat. Thing. Yeah. The big nose. Yeah, in Mortal Kombat. Oh, what fatality. fatality. <laughs> I, have, I don't know anything the mothersh- about Alf. The mothership comes and annihilates them. I just want to see <laughs> Alf does the bit, Scorpion. <laughs> it does the bit from Independence Day. <laughs> <laughs> well, they've started doing that in Mortal Kombat, haven't they? Because you've had um, Mortal Kombat 10, I think, or 11. Had Terminator, Predator, Alien. Uh, Jason's been in Mortal Kombat. And the new one got Omni-Man in it from Omni-Man. Invincible. Yeah. It's basically Superman but evil. Yeah, because they've... Um, Essentially, because the same company that does the Mortal Kombat series does all of the DC video games, like the fighting games. Uh, Injustice, I think it's called. Yeah. Um, but anyway, so I watched this back in the day, and I remember thinking at the time it was kind of a cool concept, not brilliantly executed. But I was young. I didn't really know how to articulate what was wrong. That's just the overarching theme that stuck with me. Uh, Dracula has a cool outfit in this, I have to say. Uh, yeah, like the black sort of almost formal jacket, isn't it? Yeah, but it's it's a cool design. It's not overly camp. The cape's not there, which is fine by me. One of the only times I've seen Dracula with a ponytail as well. Yeah. And he usually has short, works. slick back hair, doesn't he? Yeah. Uh, works for the character, I think, in this particular iteration. Yeah. Richard Roxburgh a... does fine. Richard Roxburgh yeah. is not the problem with this film. No, uh, and I like... One of the things I do like is... For the most part, barring one really fucking stupid, pointless scene, uh, I love the gothic aesthetic that they go with in this movie. Some of it is still unnecessary. Some of it's silly. Makes a little sense. But, again, it, that's an issue with the direction and some of the writing. The actual aesthetic of the place, I love that sort of... And especially at this time, I was a grunger slash goth. Yeah. So I was really into that idea of the goth aesthetic. Yeah, and yeah. looking back, I'm like... I just wish it looked better in terms of its visual effects and the fact that they'd done it. I wish they'd done more of it practically. Yeah. So that you would have looked better. Some of the other stuff I like, though, um, actually, you know what? Let, let's talk about the movie before I get to that. So uh, my memory is I actually, um, obviously, I, I was, I'm obviously younger than you. So when I saw this for the first time, I was literally about 13. Um, I didn't see a single problem with this film at 13. At 13, I loved this. I thought it was brilliant. 
I even got upset when Beckinsale dies at the end. Having watched it as an adult, it doesn't work at all. No, it doesn't. You watch it and you're like, oh, he he tackled her hard. Yeah. But in but all she's the been way dropped through, from buildings. All the way through this film, she's been being slammed through walls and ceilings, and it, it's one of those things where it's like it's that typical thing they do in some films where there's no stakes until suddenly the script needs stakes. Yeah. It's plot armor. Yeah. Um, and how many people have plot armor? They're all meant to be just normal humans, other than obviously the monsters. Yeah, well, I suppose, yeah. and the hint, the sort of hint that never pays off because they never made the sequel. The suggestion is Van Helsing isn't actually yeah, human. But I'm talking about like the townspeople as well. The amount of them that get picked up and dropped from fucking great heights and they're like, oh my god, not, not even a fucking twisted ankle. Yeah. You're like, really? Are you yeah. sure? <laughs> it feels a bit too much like trying to. Because if, if I just look here. On the DVD, it's only rated 12, and yeah. I feel like... I reckon they cut quite a bit. To I do. In. I feel like they were very much trying Having to that, get that block, because they wanted it to be a blockbuster because of how expensive it was. I think the other problem, though, actually, I'd like to believe that there's you know a potential gorier edit of this, but I don't think there is. No, I and think the they knew is, from the beginning that they had to aim for 12. Yeah, because this is also the same guy who did the second mummy movie which is fucking garbage but it's the pro- part of the problem with it among many other problems with the mummy too is how neutered it is for a child-friendly audience yeah. so i think this had it wasn't as bad as mummy 2 for that don't get me wrong no. like the, the one benefit it has it doesn't have a fucking eight year old going whoa cute as someone literally melts into death in front of them, and you'd be like, no, that's a kid who'd be traumatised. Yeah. Um, See, that... It doesn't go that bad, yeah. but at the same time, it's still, it's a little too light. It's a shame, isn't it, because he, he got the balance perfect in the first Mummy. The first Mummy, actually, when I saw, not now as an adult, but as a kid, it's actually quite scary in places. Mm. Like, when they're getting sealed in the coffins with all the flesh-eating scarabs and stuff, yeah. and, like, when Imhotep's in his sort of monster form... And he's like going around absorbing people's life force and shit. Um, that was quite scary as a kid. And you kind of watch this and you're like, even as a kid, none of this was scary. I think what it is, is the first mummy, I think what they did well with the first mummy, they where how they got the balance right, was the actual world was quite grounded, quite realistic, quite accurate to its time period. Don't get me wrong, there's a bit of flagrance but generally quite accurate to its time period and the horror is genuinely horror and then to get it a more child friendly or more family friendly tone what he did is he counterbalanced that with colorful characters that could then do that whole a little bit of bathos where you'd have uh, the lead guy calling out the the ridiculousness of the situation or and, and you'd have that interplay of arguments between the two the male and the female lead and you'd have the silly come along friend so you had kind of family-friendly characters, but within a world which took the horror seriously. Yeah. With this, unfortunately, I think the big downside to Van Helsing is in its script, where it tries to take the characters too seriously, but the world is now ridiculous. And actually, it needed to take the horror more seriously and have the characters be more colourful within that universe. Van Helsing is quite standard generic stoic there's too much focus on making him cool yeah whereas uh i can't actually remember the name of brendan fraser's character uh in the mummy all of a sudden but he's not really caring about being he, cool he's cool because he's so aloof oh, it's really bugging me that combo he's got it. it's something i can't rick o'connell uh rick o'connell is not cool he's not written to be cool he becomes cool but he's not written that way whereas van helsing in this film is essentially written as an 1800s James Bond. Yeah. He's got an armory of high-tech gadgets. He has that moment where the guy is basically Q. The yeah. The friar. I don't remember the friar's name. Uh, just... David Wenham plays him. Carl. Yeah. You literally get the lab scene in most James Bond films where he's like, now, Bond, I've got you this exploding pen and I've got you this. Yeah. Don't press it too soon. Uh, I'm surprised he didn't give him an Aston Martin that was, like, yeah. horse-pulled. And it's also going um, to be from a secret society, but when he goes underground to the secret society, not only has he got the Q lab, but essentially, there's, like, 600 people down there, and you're like, I know. sorry, this is, an like, an 1800s French town. Like, 600 people is the town. Yeah. What sort of secret society is this? I know. Like, yeah, it's... It, it, this is the problem, and the other thing that 
comes wrong with that is that's the scene he gets the crossbow they're like the auto automatic crossbow which is ridiculous and there's an idea in it itself that seems to have an infinite number of bolts and fires like at a super speed almost like a chain gun i'm gonna say it's firing like a gatling gun in it yeah. it's just like and at the same time you're like well brendan fraser's mummy again it did bend reality based on the time period it was set in but it was never like he he suddenly managed to get a fucking rocket propelled grenade launcher out of nowhere. It was stuff that sort of fit in with the time, yeah. and it was the characters that added the flavor. Now, in order to try and be cool, we've got a stoic, generic lead with Hugh Jackman that's not particularly colorful, and he's been given an array of gadgets that just literally cannot exist in this time period. And that means that the universe you're in is now pure fantasy. So the horror doesn't play off. The whole point, the horror plays off in a fan, in, in these sort of movies because there's got to be some level of grounding. Well, they have to be disadvantaged, and Van Helsing never feels like he's disadvantaged. Oh, he's got all of the weapons at his disposal yeah. at all times. Whereas Rick, Rick O'Connell and uh, the characters in The Mummy they're just guys. always feel like they're on the back foot yeah. against Himo- Imhotep. Yeah. That's partly why Mummy Returns doesn't work, because they don't feel like they're on the back foot. Yeah. Because they've dealt with this before. Yeah. So you need to add a new threat, and the new threat they add is a PS1 graphic rock. As a scorpion, as a scorpion man. man, yeah, the like, Scorpion King was good as well. What the film, the Scorpion King? Yeah, I haven't seen that. It's great. The, the Mummy Returns was bad mm. enough that it put me off watching the Scorpion. I'll be King. honest, I preferred the Scorpion King to the Mummy Returns. Yeah, but it's not a big jump by any margin. No, <laughs> it's not a good. Film. No, and yet they ended up making three of them, and the Scorpion King's played by a different person in each one. I think The Rock was like, yeah, I'm a bounce, this is bullshit. <laughs> and it's like a gradually declining quality of actor as oh, well. Yeah. Because it, the first one's The Rock, I actually can't remember who the second one is, but it's someone a bit worse than The Rock in terms of how famous they yeah. are. And then the third one is like Randy Couture, the UFC fighter who's got a small role in The Expendables. Yeah, yeah. But he has about three lines. I think they should do a fourth one with Danny DeVito. Right. As the Scorpion King. <laughs> Too famous. <laughs> yeah, it's true. <laughs> but I just, I like the idea that the Scorpion King gets shorter yeah. as the films go on. <laughs> yeah. So let's talk about what works in the film. Yeah. Because um, Beckinsale's corset. Which I've just looked up. She hated and she uh, she wanted to burn it all. Of course she hated it. It looks tight as shit. She was probably uncomfortable as fuck for the entire... Probably film. couldn't fucking breathe. So the film, in some ways, has not aged nearly as badly as I was expecting it to. A lot of the CGI surprisingly holds up. There's a lot of it that doesn't. But a lot more of it holds up than I thought would. Yeah. I thought that when the brides are in their monster forms... I thought that was going to look awful. I thought it was going to look pasted on. I mean, it does, they do PS2 look like they're... graphics. It does, it does look a bit like they're wearing papier-mâché. Um, like the texture doesn't feel A little bit. They, right. they kind of remind me of Mr. X, how Mr. X looks in Resi 2 Remake, where he's got that sort of wrinkled grey skin. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I they think were... they've given him like a bat skin, maybe. that was Maybe that was the idea, so yeah. it's not... But the, t- the texturing's not quite right. Yeah. It's better than I expected. I will yeah. grant you that. And a lot of the CGI backdrops are better than I expected. Having just watched recently, we did uh, episode one, The Phantom Menace. And the CGI, back- the green screening, that is absolutely terrible all the way through the movie. There's a couple of scenes in this film where it doesn't work very well. But a lot of the time it worked quite well. And I think that might be because... There's very few scenes that are entirely green screen. A lot of them, the foreground set is a set that's been built. So there are like actual columns and arches and things. And then the backdrop is CGI, which I think helps your brain to accept it all as one thing. Yeah, because there's something real to set your eye on. And I'll be honest, (laughs) this is going to sound really shitty of me to say, but it is true. The CGI backgrounds in this look way better than the CGI backgrounds in Man of Steel. They look more realistic. 
bear in mind, Man of yes. Steel is a much more recent film with a bigger yeah. budget. No, I'd agree. Um, a lot of these modern superhero, I'd even go, I'd even go more modern than Man of Steel, to be quite frank. Um, things like Justice League, um, some of the recent Marvel movies. Um, the They're relying scene. too heavily on it and not giving enough time to make it look right. Yeah. Um, yeah, it, everything's rushed now. This film, oh, I, I really like the setup for the film. I love the black and white opening still. I think that's great. Yeah, I loved how cheap. So there was a, some parts of that. I What I loved was there was a bit where Frankenstein is carrying Dr. Frankenstein uh, to the windmill. It looks like a tiny miniature. It probably is a tiny slap on miniature with a really crap background. And you know what? It was like, yes, this looks like the old monster movies of old. And you don't want it all the way through. And I'm glad they didn't do it all the way through. But for this intro, it was like a cheesy but cool throwback to the original movies. And I'm just like, why couldn't they do have done more of this? Yeah. Like, this is so cool. Um, I I like I like the first attack on the village. Um, the film sort of starts falling apart around the halfway point for me. Because everything up to that point flows. It doesn't necessarily make logical sense, some of it, but it all flows. The plot doesn't feel like it's slowing down at any point. And then around the midway bit, I think what it is is it's because the film kind of has its climax and then backtracks. They get to Dracula's castle. Well, it's actually Castle Frankenstein, the first one they go to. They get to Castle Frankenstein. They find all the egg sacks. Yeah, we'll come to that in a minute. Yeah, they work out what Dracula's evil plan is. And they stop it. Like, the babies get born, and they stop it. And you're like, okay, that's it. That's the plot. We're done. And then we jump back to build to the same climax. Yeah, again. Except this time, this time the experiment will work, quote-unquote. Because he's now got Frankenstein's monster. monster. And it's on Dracula's own castle, which happens to be through a mirror on a wall. In Kate Beckinsale's house. Yeah. And you're like, wait, so Dracula's been coming in and out of this mirror for 400 years. In Kate Beckinsale's house. Where, where her entire family have lived, generations of her family, <laughs> who have apparently dedicated their entire lives to hunting Dracula. And they didn't check the fucking mirror. I'm sorry, you deserve to die. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, you, you didn't find him in 400 years and he was in your own fucking house. Yeah. Yeah. Like, it? It's oh. totally that. It would have been funnier, though, if rather than him living in the mirror, he was just like living in the fl- crawl spaces between yeah. the floors. You know, you get that sometimes where people have been creepily living in the floor spaces between people's houses, coming down, eating stuff from their fridge at night and then hiding again. Yeah. That, that was basically Dracula. Yeah. And that, that'd be cool. That would be a cool version of Dracula. Do that. I wrote. I've, wrote, I've published. I've, I've published a short story that's that. <laughs> yeah. It's not Dracula, but oh. it's someone living in the crawl spaces in someone's house and coming out to get food. Yeah. In fact, that was the first story I ever got published. Make it Dracula. Yeah. <laughs> um. The, so let, let's talk about some of the elements that don't work as well. Oh, sorry. Do you have any more? That you I know? was just going to say that the bit, the early part of the film. Um, and obviously this was not intentional because it didn't come out until 20 years later, but it really reminds me of the game Resident Evil Village, yeah. um, which obviously is set in a snowy Romanian village, and that sort of combi- the the interesting gimmick they've done with Village is that sort of combines all the Universal Monster movies together. Well, it's a similar idea of having mon- multiple monsters, isn't it? Because you've got... Princess, Dem- Princess Lady Dimitrescu. So you've got your main enemies of the Lycans, who are right. the wolves. Then you've got Lady Dimitrescu's castle full of vampires. Yep. You've got uh, one of the bosses is called Moreau, and he's sort of a creature of the Black Lagoon type thing. Right. And then when you go to Heisenberg's factory, that's got a real Frankenstein feel to it, right. where he's like been resurrecting dead bodies with like. A, a bit of cybernetic enhancement right. to bring them back. Um, it's really weird for a Resident Evil game. And I know that's weird to say because people were like, um, well, it's had zombies. And you're like, yeah, I know, but somehow this is... I don't know, I really this is like... more towards Hammer Horror than it is yeah, the... Yeah, I don't know, I really like Resident Evil Village. It's a hell of a fun game to play and I've completed it about seven times. But it's, it is weird because the zombies are very believable as a virus thing. Whereas everything else, they're like, well, it's this mould causing it. And you're a bit like, yeah, okay. Like, 
I'll buy it just because I'm enjoying the game. But realistically, how has Mold turned this woman into a nine foot six vampire? Or even worse, because I could even accept the nine foot six vampire. Where it stretches credulity is A, she can turn into her monster form and turn back, and her monster form's a dragon. Right. Um, that's many times bigger than her human form. So how she turns back, I don't know. She must be very heavy because she's very like yeah. That mass has to go somewhere, so she must be yeah. dense. And Heisenberg. Oh my god, I just realised that's that's adding to the fetish online, isn't yeah. it? Step on me, mummy. And Heisenberg is essentially Magneto, mm. and turns into a big mech monster. Which is the bit I really would like to cut from that game. Because I don't play Resident Evil games to fight mech monsters. No. No. But yes. Yeah. So what I'm saying is, there's been other attempts to combine these franchises bef- uh, before, since, yeah. before and since. And you know what? And it never fully works. No. Though, you know what? Within the top context of a video game, the uh, automatic crossbow would have made more sense than in a movie. Because in a movie, you need to build the suspense, whereas in a video game, if you're going to kill lots of multiple monsters, having an automatic weapon would be quite useful in some scenes. Um, but this isn't a video game, so yeah. it, it feels out of place. The So some of the negatives of this is, as you say, some of the some of the story elements don't work. They don't come together properly, like fucking Dracula living in her house and her not knowing somehow makes no sense the other thing that makes no sense is where they've changed the law around dracula where instead of him biting people and converting them into uh draculas he needs to <laughs> vampires it's a dracula it's a dracula into vampires he instead somehow generates egg sacs of baby vampires so he must be able to turn vampires the traditional way, because he's obviously yeah. done that to the brides, hasn't and all, he? Yeah, and also Kate but, Beckinsale's character seems to know who they were before they were, like, when they're in human form. Oh, to be fair, I, I assumed it's just that she's been fighting them for oh, so long. Oh, it could long. be that either, yeah. But then it gets grosser, because what this must mean is that Dracula is, forgive my language, shooting loaves in the brides, yeah. who are then laying these egg sacks... From the ceiling. Which, which, first of all, humans don't... And I know they're vampires, not humans, but they're humanoid. Like, they were yeah, yeah. human. They're human shape. Humans don't lay eggs. Yeah. Like... Well, they're more like... And, and there's hundreds. So yeah. now, I, now I take you to an even more illogical question, Rory, because here's the real question that we all really need to know, Stephen Summers, if you're listening. Do they lay one egg at a time like humans only usually, unless you have twins, usually only lay one baby at a time, don't you? Uh, lay, lay one lay baby. A baby. Give birth to I'm one glad baby you're not at a, doctor, a time, Jamie. <laughs> because there's about four hundred of these egg sacs. There's thousands. Or like or, there's there's four hundred, I think, in the first one, and then it was like a thousand in this in his own castle. Right. So like, yeah, it must have been gooping the walls quite badly. Yeah. Gwyneth Paltrow or, would be pleased. Or <laughs> even grosser. Do the girls? Do the va- van brides of Dracula lay? loads of eggs at once like some other animals do yeah in which case how fucking huge must their bellies have got that's another fetish dear I'm god sure. now the inflation fetishists are after <laughs> us oh god oh god um, just, well my question about it wasn't going to be anywhere near the fetish realm no, but, but thank it, you for bringing you it see what i mean though right you see what i mean like the just the logic of how they give yeah. the birth yeah and i mean it, it just all it does by creating this element a it's not necessary and B, it just generates questions that don't need to be there. Because the reality is, is like we've got to kill Dracula. Why have we got to kill Dracula? He's only one guy. Oh, I don't know. Oh, there's going to be thousands of him. So we've got to stop them. It's like, just make the story that he bites people and converts them. Yeah. And as he converts them, you're like, we've got to stop him converting people into vampires. Because that's how he generates his army well, of vampires. The, the, the it's reason quite straightforward. You don't need to lay fucking eggs. The reason they've done this and they've overcomplicated it is obviously this is how they've tied Frankenstein in, which is he needs Frankenstein's monster to give life to the children. But would it not but, make more sense that it would be better that he bites them, but in order to revive them, he needs to jolt them th- with electric through a creature that can take the main voltage. You could do that, or I was even going to say, don't even do that. All they talk about is how, you know, the whole point is Frankenstein's found the key to life. 
have it be that Dracula wants to live again. Yeah. He he goes on multiple times about the curse of living forever as a dead man. Yeah. Mate, he's, he's you, got that you whole... just solved the fucking story. Yeah. And then you and then because then you do that hubris thing where do the thing where no one can beat him because he's fucking Dracula with all his powers makes himself human and they're like cool now we can beat you you dumb fuck because you're human again yeah yeah I'd have done that personally or they put him in prison for the rest of his life and it's like what was the point no you gotta kill him that'd be such a weak ending well weaker than in, this into the judicial system with you Dracula <laughs> you've been a naughty boy. <laughs> I have an answer to your question about not knowing much about Van Helsing, by the way, as a person. And was it supposed to be in the sequel? Uh, well, it doesn't say that. I assume it was. Um, all we've got is what's left in this movie. Okay. So it says, throughout this movie, it's implied that Van Helsing is the Archangel Gabriel. Yes, I picked up on that. Because um, actually, Van Helsing's original name is Abraham. Yes. But they changed it to, to Gabriel. Gabriel and he refers to him as the left hand of God. Yeah, so... He- he mentions fighting the Romans at Masada, to which Carl responds, that was in 73 AD, uh, referring to the siege of, Masaja, Mas- siege of Masada in the First Jewish-Roman War. Later, Dracula gives his first name as Gabriel and refers to him as the left hand of God. Gabriel is considered God's messenger and was the angel to tell Zachariah and the Virgin Mary of John the Baptist and Jesus' births, respectively. So, yeah, basically, it looks like Van Helsing in this was a bit of a bastardization, even within himself. Because he was basically Archangel Gabriel meets Van Helsing. And it's very similar because, like, again, Dracula is not really Dracula because he lays fucking eggs. Yeah. Um, and what were the little people? Oh, there was the, a bunch of bloody the, Jawas what? from Star Wars yeah. set up in Sir uh, Flipping Dracula. We looked them up. They're Simon Side Dwarves. They're from, they're actually from, funnily enough, fair play. This is a deep pull from him because this is not a universal thing. They're from a very specific type of British folklore that only really exists in the county of Northumberland. Interesting. But Northumberland is a, is a county, isn't it, or is it a city? I can't remember. I'm pretty sure Northumberland's a county, right up north. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's up north, anyway, that's why I wouldn't know. But I was going to say, is, I don't know It's an interesting all... pull, but they never established them. No, no, they're they just, just turned up. They're fucking there. It's, a, it's hilarious, isn't it? It's just it a bunch of fucking they're, they're not there. They're not mentioned at all. No, they're just... And then at one point... No one even does anything with them. And then at one point, Dracula just kind of, he's in his castle, and I think it's when he's doing his speech about <laughs> how he's got no feelings. He's like, I am hollow. And he like looks up, and it's just on this balcony. There's all these jowls <laughs> in little mining suits just looking at him going, bit of bitty, bit of bitty. Fucking Oompa Loompas. That's what they yeah, are. Yeah, yeah. Um, and th- what's funny is there's loads of scenes where they're doing stuff on screen. What they're doing is bollock. And you can tell, like, there's one person just welding a wall. And they're like, it's what? The, it's the guy who and keeps th- ziplining back and forth. He's on a winch <laughs> zipline. And he just keeps going back. And he's like, what are you doing? Like, clearly you're doing fuck That's the all. definition of looking busy when the <laughs> boss is looking. <laughs> it is, yeah. And it, it is funny to watch just how shit it is. But again, like, it would have been nice to have established that yeah. rather than just throw it in and go, eh, just fucking dwarf people running around. Yeah, there's nothing in the first mummy that just gets thrown at you without an explanation, no. is it? You you understand everything that's happening in the first mummy film. Yeah. And yeah, so these, these characters have no introduction. We get an introduction to Dracula. We get an introduction to Frankenstein. Igor just kind of decides to work for Dracula, and the only well, explanation he's a we get capitalist. Yeah, because for some reason, right at the beginning, all we get is he pays me, and then he runs away, and then appears again with. To, Dracula. to be fair, so, I'm gonna give I'm gonna give the film this though. To be fair, the only explanation I need for henchmen being evil is the bad guys paying them. That's that's enough of a motivation for henchmen, as far as I'm concerned. Oh no, no, I get that, but Igor is like a known character, and from he, Frankenstein, and he was never established as being money hungry so that's kind of a that's a, again a bit of a bastardization yeah of a character. It, it would have made a little bit more sense what does he need money for he lives in a fucking castle away from everyone else I, I, i'm assuming it's just i want a flat screen tv i'm assuming the reason they went with it that way is just that igor is more famous in pop culture because actually logically it would have made more sense i think for that character to have been renfield yeah who in the original Dracula was played by Dwight Fry, um, and he's sort of a human that's been hypnotised by Dracula yeah. to do his bidding. It would make a lot um, more sense. And he eats flies. And Alice Cooper did a song about him called The Ballad of Dwight Fry. 
It's a pretty good song, actually. White Fry or he, White Flies? He usually sings it wrapped in a straight jacket. Oh, in, okay. fact, in fact, it's usually the last song in his show. It's usually the last song he sings before he gets beheaded. Nice. Yeah. That would have made more sense, I think, than Igor. But I think Igor is just more famous in pop culture because he's because he's got the fucked up appearance. Whereas Renfield's just a normal looking bloke who's crazy. Yeah. Whereas Igor's got like the hunchback and the yeah. limp. And there's a few times the they almost face. reference a, the hunchback without it being the hunchback because there's the Igor has the hunchback. And then at the beginning when you've got um, Mr. Hyde's at Notre Dame, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, and there's a bit where he says the bells and yeah. they've got the big bell they're ringing, which at is Dame. really weird because. Miss Jekyll and Hyde is traditionally a London set story, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, so he's just um, decided he's going to go party in France. Do you know what it might be? This is just me guessing, and I'm probably making this up off the top of my head, but could it be they wanted to do Hunchback of Notre Dame because that is, as we, we've said in the quiz, technically the first Universal Monster movie, but then they went, oh, Disney have the rights to the Hunchback of Notre Dame somehow. Because they did make a Hunchback of Notre Dame I film. I think they've got that. No, uh, uh, hmm. well, could it be I, that they were a little worried Disney would try and stick their oar in? Maybe. So they went, fuck it, let's just change it to Jekyll and Hyde. Yeah, maybe. Who's definitely out of copyright. Well, so I think Hunchback of Notre Dame is out of copyright. Right. Um, but I think the even if it wasn't, it would have been theirs first because they made a film before Disney did. I think the main issue is that Disney's was more recent and they didn't want to run the risk of pissing off disney which is understandable yeah disney have very good lawyers yeah <laughs> they've the got the money heartless bitch um but yeah it's it, it's these things where they've uh, i understand that trying to slam all these monsters together in a movie you will need to adapt them somewhat but they seem to have over adapted because as you say like rather trying to revive a thousand fucking baby draculas makes less sense and over complicates your story then it you, then if you just used fucking Dracula, I want to live again. Um, you've got and also the lichens. There's lichens in this, but there's very little explanation as to you know what benefit they really have other than just being another henchman. But not really. There's one lichen that they you start off with. Um, I was going to say Christine Aguilera. Uh, <laughs> there's the there's, there's the Bacon one that is, yeah, so Beckinsale and her brother go after a lichen. Which bites the brother. Yep, yeah, but we don't see that lichen die, but assumedly it's gone. But then obviously her brother becomes a lichen. I think all you see of that is it plunges over the edge of that cliff, doesn't it? Yeah, but considering everything else seems it to It could easily succeed. have survived, yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the other thing as well is... So the brother becomes a lichen, and then the next we sort of see of him is he's trying to warn Beckinsale about dracula mm. but then he keeps returning to dracula to do his bidding yeah and the closest sort of look we get to that is that for some reason in lichen form he's loyal to dracula but when he turns back to him he's like i'll never do what you want i'll never do your bidding it's like you already have been and like, there's an easy solution what? to this as well historically in the novel and in some of the films including the gary oldman dracula mm. dracula has hypnosis powers yeah. we just needed to see a scene of that we just needed to see a scene of him hypnotizing him to do his bidding. Um, literally a quick look into my eyes type thing. Um, because they even say, don't they, that only a werewolf who had the willpower to overcome Dracula would be able to kill him. Yeah. Uh, willpower to, to disobey him. Great. So make the hypnosis thing a thing. Then at the end, spoiler, when Hugh Jackman becomes a werewolf... Have Dracula be like, fine, I'm going to turn you into my new henchman, look into my eyes, and have, you know, it'd be still be cheesy, yeah. but, you know, Van Helsing's the only one strong enough to fight it off and yeah. turn on him. Because the left hand of God would not do Dracula's bidding. It'd certainly be better than the bollocks where, uh, which I'm pretty sure was done to save budget, uh, they both they keep turning back into their human form. Once the final fight has started, instead of just having the two monsters fight, they constantly keep turning back into human form for no reason. To have little conversations. And, and I'm fairly certain that's to save budget. Yeah. <laughs> also, I'll be honest... I don't like the two monsters fighting at the end. No, I didn't need um, that. And I'll tell you why. I'll tell you exactly what it reminds me of. Godzilla Kong? No. It reminds me exactly, certainly because it's people turning into CGI monsters from human beings. 
it's the ending to Mortal Kombat Annihilation. And I don't Animality. Need, yeah. I don't need another animality. Yeah. Like anyone who hasn't listened to it, we did it on VGMP. Um, but trust me, you're not missing out if you don't see Mortal Kombat Annihilation. It's garbage. And one of the reasons it's garbage is it's overuse of CGI. And at the end, Liu Kang and Shao Kahn have a fight, but they don't fight as each other. They turn into big CGI dragons. Now, to be fair, the CGI is far worse than this movie. <laughs> um but again, it's the same plot device and i'm sorry cgi creatures slapping each other doesn't do it for me that's like going i want to do cgi wrestling please yeah. it's like no the whole reason you're watching it is people artfully slapping each other you know it's not real like that's in terms of it's not a real fight there's yeah. still artistry to it but there, there's still artistry to it it's something's a show. happening in a physical space yeah but if you then just do like, and it's a different thing if you're playing a video game of it because there's a strategy and a gameplay to it. But if you're just watching CGI s- wrestling, yeah. we just go, oh, he's going to put CGI Stone Cold versus CGI Undertaker in a slapping match. You'd be like, who cares? Like, what's the po- Why would I watch CGI wrestlers slap each other? Yeah. There's no artistry to it. No. Um. So. And it, unfortunately, when you have, and it's the same problem I had with Man of Steel, you've got two CGI. They still look human in it, but let's be honest, it's CGI fights. I can't be asked. Same again with the Matrix Resurrection, uh, not Resurrection, which is it? The third one, Revolution. Revolutions. Matrix Revolutions. The the end of it is Smith versus Neo, but they're both CGI, so I don't care. Yeah. There's nothing in it, and often it feels floaty. And it seemed to be because CGI was suddenly coming to the fore at this point, because this is about the same time as Matrix Revolutions. Um, they decided to insert it a lot more. As you said, uh, was it Ebert said that this is like uh, this is how not to make a movie? Oh no, that wasn't it. Ebert was quite positive on this. That was oh, the other guy. That was the other guy. Uh, yeah, the- who was like, this is awful. Who said it was as bad as Battlefield? Yeah. Earth? See, I don't agree with that because it is. A quite enjoyable romp, but when it comes to the overuse of CGI, this film is a horrible example of overuse of CGI. And he was right; it's not the way you want to make a movie. And the irony being, it is now exactly how you make every movie. This is like the start of the end, isn't it? Yeah, um, it's too long as well. That's another problem. Yeah, this film's too long. If fine, if you're going to be a brainless adventure film, that's fine. Just do that under ninety minutes. Yeah. This is like, two, I think this is slightly over two hours, I yeah, think. You can't, sorry, don't waste my time for two hours on Brainless. Yeah. Brainless has a cutoff point. Yeah, like, give me a nice tight 90 minutes. I don't need the ballroom scene. Oh, that was I, it. We haven't mentioned that yet. So yeah. the ballroom scene, there's a sequence after Dracula kidnaps Kate Beckinsale. Kate Beckinsale. Anna. Anna. Uh, Kate, kidnaps Kate Beckinsale. He then starts doing this dance with her in a ballroom. Now, all of a sudden, we're not in a gothic Land, or it's not. It's not lit gothically yeah, anymore. This is more of like a Renaissance yeah. type set. Isn't We've jumped it? from gothic to Renaissance. They're all done like in the mask, as if it's eyes wide shut. And he's just like dance with me. And it's like he's trying to. He's like I can hypnotize anybody, but he doesn't actually hypnotize them while doing this. So it's a pointless scene in that front. We've got loads of acrobats doing what should be very impressive acrobatics. Unfortunately, they're very clearly grabbed in from fucking clip art and pasted over the top via green screen. So these acrobats are honestly, I can't explain just how obvious it is that they're not actually in the scene. And if I didn't know better, and I do know better, but if I didn't know better, that sequence where you get like the big shot and loads of like acrobats flying at you, I would have thought this film had been made for 3D because of that, because it's Shittily done, pointless addition, adds nothing, but it's things coming at the screen. That normally only happens when it's like, oh, look, we're doing a 3D movie. Look at the things coming at you. Now, this didn't have a 3D release. This was before the resurgence of 3D, which then died again. Um, but it had that kind. It had that kind of mark to it. Yeah. And I was like, don't just drop this sequence. It literally added yeah. nothing. Well, not only does it add nothing, it also ruins the plot even further because, oh, what's the twist at the end of the scene? They're all vampires. Oh! So Dracula can just turn people regularly. Yeah. And they all disappear. They don't all die. 
They do. Do they? Yeah, that's when I, that's the bit you looked down at your phone. I was like, oh, come on. Do you remember the device that the fryer kept going? I know what it does, but I don't know what oh, it's for. Oh, he used that, He's yeah. like, I know what it's for, and he sets it off. And it fine. I'm fine with it being a flash grenade. Slightly out of time, but fine. It A bunch of these vampires swarm into the room, and it explodes. And you're like, okay, cool. It's going to vaporize all of them. That's fine. It then cuts to a wide shot from outside the castle, and every window in this castle that I'm not joking is the size of Buckingham Palace. Every window flashes with this bright light, like the light has the light from this little grenade has somehow filled the entire building, right. even crossing floor boundaries. Right, and therefore would have wiped out everything, which includes Dracula. Yeah, because he's in the building. Yeah. But it yeah. just somehow doesn't... Yeah, plot armour again. It's, it's like, come on. Yeah. Didn't need that. No. It, and again, you could have easily saved all of that catastrophe, just cut the scene. Yeah. Um, the other... And you would have saved time, and it would not have slowed down the film as much. The other thing that I thought was shit, not only did they kill Kate Beckinsale, which I think is another reason that neutered the potential for a sequel, because it's like, well, I want to make a second one. Well, then it's Hugh Jackman and who? The Friar? I'm sorry, he's not a big enough character well, nor a big enough name. What they'd have done is they'd have turned it into sort of a Bond girl thing, yeah. they, where it's a different girl every There was very film. clearly a Bond influence going through it. But the problem was, unfortunately, we were getting to a point where even in the Bond franchise, they were trying to steer a little bit further away from just having standard sexy Bond chick. Th- this is, is the their same Friar year. Candy. This is the same year as Die Another Day, which famously stunted Bond for a little while, didn't it? Because, uh, well, it's not good, is it? <laughs> die Another Day. Which one was Die Another Day? That's the Ice Pie. It's the last Brosnan one. Oh, right, yeah. That's the that's one Madonna the... did the awful theme tune for. Yeah, it's which... like a weird electronic theme tune. I always tune. remember there being a huge gap between that film and Casino Royale, but it's actually only like two, three years. Yeah. It's really not that long in no. between. Uh, but it was a big focus shift, shift yeah. for Casino Royale. Um. Yeah, and the other thing that I thought was really garbage, not only did you kill the like one of the main characters, which was the only the only thing that was left in the end was your three leads. And let's be honest, the fried is a lead that doesn't really count. You've killed one of your two leads, the hot one. Yeah. <laughs> but also you've left nothing open for how a sequel would run. And the way that she dies is, as you say, pointless. She just sort of gets rugby tackled and that kills her. And on top of that, <laughs> so they burn her on a pyre, don't they? In like, what is very clearly, they've been green screened onto shots of Ireland. Yeah. Um, but they burn her on this pyre. Her body gets set on flames. No wonder they call him a friar. And, they <laughs> sorry, Jamie. And then there's this really cheesy shit sequence where he turns around to look at the sky to remin- reminisce about her, and there's, like, way too close superimposed images of her face looking at him, smiling and winking, going, hey, you got it, kid. Yeah, yeah you did f- this. fair play. Even and as it's a, like, that shit. That e- is shit. Even when I saw this as a kid, that bit, I was like, fuck's sake. Yeah, it's like, just to have him look... It's the early 2000s, as we noted with... Um, three to tango and a few other things this is the era where you could just have music and people looking wistfully just honestly i would have preferred it than having her sit and it's it's not even just once it's not like he looks up and she looks there and she's like way to go kid and walks off whatever right it, they do it three or four times well you, it's not like, just her either it's all her fam all her dead relatives yeah, isn't it but who the, gives a shit because the idea is meant to be it's oh tough, she's reunited yeah. with her family in heaven and yeah, yeah i don't care I don't care. I don't care at this point. Also, we've never met her family other than the brother. Yeah, so, seen a picture of her dad. Yeah, so it's like, yeah, and it's like, hey, she's back. Do you remember the dad? No. No one, even she doesn't remember her dad. Like, <laughs> it's, it's so inconsequential to the movie. Oh, and here's Auntie Bernadette. Was she in the film? No, but she's back with Auntie Bernadette. I can't imagine if they had have gotten around to the sequel... I can't imagine it would have been any good. Because traditionally speaking, sequels usually dip from the original. And you're already not starting in a great place with this film. So if it can only go down from here... Yeah, I I can't see... I mean... And you'd be going to less famous Universal Monsters at that point. 
Yeah, it, like it, you've done the biggest three what, in this movie. What's weird as well is not only have they done so they've done the biggest three: Dracula, yeah. Frankenstein, and Wolfman. Wolfman. And to be fair, I do suppose that if they wanted to, they could crowbar Frankenstein back into the next one because he, he doesn't die. No, and Wolfman because there could be more lichens out there. Yeah, but um, Dracula's gone, gone. Dracula's gone, gone. But the the other thing as well is that it doesn't just let's say remove those three from the element. There's at least two others, I think. Because you've got um, Jekyll and Hyde. Yeah, that's gone. He's dead. Yeah, he's dead. He's just killed in an intro sequence. Yeah. Uh, Igor's gone. Igor's gone. So I think the one, if I remember reading right, the ones they were going to do for the next one was Phantom of the Opera, which probably that's where your female lead would come in. Because obviously there's a girl who's super important in that story who the Phantom's in love with, isn't there? It would have made sense to keep Kate Beckinsale um, and have her be, be the it, I know. I think it was Phantom of the Opera, The Invisible Man, and Creature from the Black Lagoon. I don't quite know how you're going to put the... Cr- the creature would have to be like living in the River Seine or something, wouldn't he? We'll just do it in London, River Thames. Yeah. <laughs> Comes out like, yeah. In, like in London he's, now, he's covered in turds. He's actually... <laughs> his origin story is he was actually just a, ra- a normal British man who fell into the River Thames after being out drinking one night and it's so polluted it mutated him yeah no he just comes out covered in sewage yeah that's all it is (laughs) um yeah and also like to be fair 2004 like say they made the sequel the next year say so 2005 would have been the earliest that van helsing 2 would have come out i don't know if john cena was famous enough at that point (laughs) no he wouldn't have been he'd like just started in wwe at that point and was still a bad guy he wasn't John you know, Cena. And you know what would have made more sense is Van, if you did Phantom of the Opera and Dracula, because they have very similar aesthetics, is that Kate Beckinsale is wooed by the Phantom of the Opera, who then turns out to be Dracula. Yeah. Two in one. And you get bro- get rid of both your caped fucking mystery men in one yeah. go. And then he disappears, and that's your invention. Do, 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 do. <laughs> Phantom of the Opera. The Phantom of the Opera. What other monsters are there? Because how would you do a third after you've done those as well? They'd have to somehow get the mummy back, wouldn't they? Yeah, so they'd have to do the mummy again. They haven't done a witch yet. Was there a witch as a an old as one of the? They're a bit generic, aren't they, witches? That's um... what I mean. It's like usually, I suppose you got the picture of Dorian Gray. Would that count? I don't know if Universal ever did a picture of Dorian Gray. I know there's classic ones, but I don't know who did. Well, that is a classic era one, isn't it? Yeah, but again, it's like yeah, at this point you're now. You, if you're trying to do like a series of it, you've done so many in your first movie that it's why it's why you, you're struggling with a trilogy. It's why their attempt at a dark universe never made any sense to me. I yeah. was like, you ain't got enough characters. You're trying to build an MCU out of Universal monsters, and you a you don't have enough characters, and b your big Avengers style team up film has already been made, and it's called Van Helsing. Yeah. So, Picture Drawing Grey was MGM, so they didn't even have that. Mm. And that was clearly where they were going. I don't know if you saw. I don't know if you had the misfortune of seeing the twenty seventeen Mummy movie with Tom Cruise. Not yet. I have got a copy of it. Where but... clearly where they're going with it is Tom Cruise's Van Helsing. Yeah. So you're just going to make Van Helsing. Yeah. With a shorter Van Helsing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It it wasn't good. It was a really bad movie. Yeah. I really wanted to like it. And I just, it was, people need to stop trying to be the MCU. MCU was a flash in the pan. It's happened. They caught lightning in a bottle. Because even they're failing now. They're yeah. crumbling. But the thing is, is that the reason that they succeeded initially is something you could replicate with... Honestly, I think you could do it with Universal Monsters. The problem is, is that they won't want to put the time in to do it. No, which is... So, that's the biggest problem with... The, there's a lot of problems with the 2017 Mummy, but the biggest problem is halfway through the film, the titular mummy, who we're all supposed to be scared of, who's supposed to be the big bad of the film, gets captured by... I can't remember what name they gave it, but they may as well have called it Shield, right? Because it's Shield, right? 
and Russell fucking Crowe turns up and the whole mummy plot stops for, I might be exaggerating here, but my memory is it's about 20 fucking minutes of the movie while he stands there and monologues to Tom Cruise setting up the whole universe. Well, our organization has been collecting paranormal individuals. Yeah, uh, Yeah. You could, you need to, you can't establish it that early on. And then you start going, okay, so one, you're forcing exposition on me. Two, you are just ripping off the MCU. And three, the mummy's been beaten already. We're halfway through the film. The mummy's beaten. Yeah. She's been captured and strapped up and I'm not the scared of her. The mummy becomes incidental in her own movie. Because fat Russell Crowe's beating her up. <laughs> it's not gladiator era Russell Crowe. No. We're talking modern chubby Russell Crowe. Like beating up Sophia Boutella. But no, the point is, is how the MCU did it, it didn't start with an MCU. No, just Iron Man. Just Iron Focus Man. Focus on getting the well, first film Well, to be fair, right. I think the first one was Incredible Hulk. No, it was Iron Man. That's a reboot it, did they no, not? No, it was Iron Man first. Okay, and then they did the Incredible Hulk. Ed Norton yeah. Hulk. Right, yeah, because okay. RDJ is in Incredible Hulk right. as a very brief cameo as yeah. Tony Stark. So they start with one, Iron Man. It's not part of a bigger universe. It's just a story of Iron Man. They then did the story of Incredible Hulk. They then did the story of Captain America. And while there are certain connection threads happening in the background, they're more like cameos. Yeah. They're not setting up a big expanded universe. And all the setup stuff... Post credit sequence. Yeah. Fine, do that. Stick it in the credit yeah, bit. It's not necessary for your story to work. Yeah. And then after they'd done that and Thor, they then went, Well, let's do an Avengers movie. Now we've got five established characters in films that have their own distinct so- sub genres within our superhero market yeah. that each of them have had a, at least a what's considered to be a good movie each so you like the characters and they're already established we then do an avengers and the an avengers movie is just putting them all together and let's be honest avengers is not a brilliant movie but it's a perfectly fun movie and you don't need to re-establish characters because they're done so you've done your hard work already but you've already got people liking your characters with the marvel movie uh, with the to do that with the horror monsters you'd have to do like you know do a frankenstein movie do a mummy movie do a a fucking Dracula movie and you'd have to build them all up as individual movies just within their own shit and you can add little things that could connect later on but for right now just make sure you get this story right but even connecting them what's your end game here because you only have two options the way I see it one you make Van Helsing again yep which is one man trying to fight them they've all teamed up for some reason or Actually, there's three options. Or you go Freddy versus Jason, but it's like a massive free-for-all with them all fighting each other. Or even worse, which is the one I think they were going to do, you do Suicide Squad, where this team of villains are forced to work together, and they're technically the good guys. I, I, I don't usually like to speak on behalf of the world, but I'm going to on this occasion. No one wants that. No one wants a film where Dracula, Wolfman, Mummy, Frankenstein, Invisible Man are the good guys fighting an even bigger evil. You know what? I think the only way that that could work is if you did it as... So you've got to establish them all first. So you've got... They've each got to have their own establishing films first. Once we've established them, they get captured by Russell Crowe's fat shield. And then (laughs) uh, after you get they're told that they need to do a job for humanity for fat shield they go okay we'll do it then but the way that the plot line runs out is that essentially they're utilizing fat shield for their own good and they then defeat russell crowe so that's the point where russell crowe almost becomes the villain of the movie but he's actually the hero and we're following the villains. So you have to do a, almost a Breaking Bad with it. You can't turn them into, actually, Dracula's a good guy now. Yeah. You know, it's got to be a case of... But they I'd... would. That's what they do yeah, yeah. in it. But that's the only way you could do it to make it not suck, is that you'd have to go, yeah, we'll do what you want, Russell. Of course we'll listen to what you have to say, because you're the guy in charge. They they do a, cut, a little bit of whatever the missions it are, whatever it is, to take down whatever other big bad there is, and then they utilise it to their advantage to kill Russell Crowe, and take over and then go out and commit the crimes that they always do I tell again. you, I know they're going to turn them into good guys. Um, despite the mummy's uh, failure at the box office, you know, they, they, they started moving ahead with the next film in the series, you know, which was The Invisible Man. 
and they even cast it. They were literally ready to start filming, and it was Johnny Depp. As the Invisible Man. As the Invisible Man. You don't hire Mr. Depp to not exist. Exactly. So, one, you'd be seeing him all the time. (laughs) Yeah. It'd be like... He's not going to be a villain, is he? No. Johnny fucking Depp. Johnny Depp has played villains. A couple, but none of his most famous roles. No, to be fair. Astronauts and the Wife is not one of his most famous roles. You know, his most famous role is Jack Sparrow, isn't it? Jack Sparrow. Sort of an anti-villain, yeah. Yeah, An anti-hero, really. anti-hero. But yeah, it just I just don't see any way of making it work. The only not within not within a studio mindset. Definitely anyway. not. Hey, you want to do a B movie where you give me fucking Bruce Campbell as Van Helsing taking out all of these old classic monsters and it basically he's just playing Ash but you can't use Ash's name cuz of you know, copyright. Who, uh, who owns the rights to Ash? Sam Raimi. Hey, so, you get Sam Raimi to direct it, you'll have me in the fucking premiere seats, baby. Sam Raimi does Bruce Campbell versus Universal Monsters. I, I think that that would be the... that Honestly, because Ash is... There's very few good guys within the monster... The horror, horror monster. Yeah, yeah. Iconic good guys. Yeah. There's very little. Yeah. Ash technically is the only one I can think of off the top of my head. Like, iconic good guys yeah. in horror. Not really a thing. Like they're usually the waifs who happen to survive. The final girls, yeah. yeah. But or the screen girls, sometimes they're called, aren't they? Screen, screen queens. queens. So but... screen queen. It's, so there's a slight difference. Right. Screen queen refers to the actual actress who is in a lot of horror movies. Right. But the final girl is just the last girl left alive in the movie. So that's the. So Laurie Strode is a final girl, but Jamie Lee Curtis is a screen queen. Get Sam Raimi, mm. get Bruce Campbell, Ash versus Universal Monsters. Yeah. Anyway, I think that's all there is to say about Van Helsing. Van Helsing! So it's gonna... an okay film, yeah. uh, but it's it's riddled with problems that you'd have to overcome. I'm not in any rush to ever watch it again. No. No. Anyway, thank you very much for tuning in. As always, please do like, share, subscribe, etc., etc. Uh, you can check out all the rest of our Second Takes and Met episodes. You could also check out our other show, VGMP, the video game movie podcast, where we review video game adaptations, because there's a lot of them. And like the aforementioned to be, Mortal Kombat Annihilation. And there seems to be an ever-increasing amount of them, because they're making more and more of them each day. Until next time, that is a goodbye from Second Take Cinema.